So the same thing <laughs> over and over again. Uh, so maybe that's the only thing you need to remember <laughs> out of these uh, EFDs. Um, so we, we done, uh, I tried to do some work in motivating how you can um, work with low energy effective field theories, particularly in the concept of gravity, where we don't have full access to a, a full UV completion. Um, and we constructed different type of, uh, well, constructed uh, loop EFTs for gravity, and we also mentioned a little bit about um, higher spin um, EFT is coming from a high spin and the different scaling. And I try to emphasize how you should probably remain agnostic in the type of uh, completion you would like to have and just consider any generic low energy effective field theory until you have better indication of which directions you have to go to. At least that's a very systematic way to proceed in, uh, in searches for new physics. However, <laughs> now I'm going to take a slightly different approach and I'll try to, to understand whether we can uh, bootstrap ourselves back up into some of the knowledge or some of the assumptions we would like our high energy completion to have. And again, I don't want to be too specific. I don't want to commit myself to a specific realization of string theory or to, to specific uh, UV completion. Uh, but uh, we still like the UV completion to satisfy some rules of physics, uh, for instance, unitarity, some standard rules of probability. And this can propagate down back to implications on the type of um, effective field theories you can allow for yourself. So a lot of what I'm saying may seem similar to the concept of the landscape that you have heard from string theory, which is much more conjectural. They come from specific string theory compactifications, and from there they derive some rules on the type of gravitational effective field theories you can allow you for yourself. The rules I'm going to derive here are, are much more direct and, and it can be derived directly at the level of the scattering amplitude. Um, however, as soon as I say these words that I want to connect the UV completion with the IR physics, if someone on the street comes to you and say, I have a way to connect the UV to the IR, you should be very suspicious because we have argued that we can live our lives at low energy uh, and do most of what we do uh, at low energy every day without having any insight on what the high energy completion is. I can cross the street without needing to know what is string theory. I can do my everyday experiment without needing to have a full knowledge of what's going on in the high energy completion because there's a decoupling of scale between what happens at high energy and what happens at low energy. And now I'm going to tell you that this, even though there's a decoupling of scale, there's still some information that you have at high energy that propagates down into the classes of effective field theories that you can allow yourself at low energy. And ultimately, I would like to do that for gravity, but I won't have much time for that today. But what we can start with is cases, for instance, in scalar field theories or in, in vector field theories, where we have some UV completions, and we can draw some rules from that, and then I'm going to try to be a little bit more uh, generic. So let me start with a scalar field theory, uh, which, uh, <laughs> which is the simplest example I can think of. So far, imagine you have a scalar field in your low energy representation of the world. I don't know what this kind of field is, but let's just remain uh, general. And you happen to have an operator which behaves like that. So it happens to be a shift symmetric um, effective field theory, doesn't matter uh, too much. And you have an operator which looks like this. Now, this scalar field, you can think of various type of UV completion in which you would come from. You can think of this scalar field, in one case, it could correspond to the motion of a higher dimensional brain, uh, a, sorry, a three plus one dimensional brain in an extra dimension. So imagine the world was five dimensional. So these are the four dimensions we live in. We have a higher dimension Y, and this field parametrize the position of the four-dimensional brain we may happen to be living in, in the extra dimension. This, in this representation, that's just an example, in this representation, that operator will correspond to the first relativistic correction of this membrane in the extra dimension. And if you want a membrane to be living in an extra dimension of space, it will happen, you can do that from the um, relativistic factor. This is an exercise you can do very easily. You will see that this coefficient c will have to be positive. If you wanted this coefficient c to be negative, you would need to embed this brain in an extra dimension of time. 
And already that doesn't seem to be very consistent with unitarity preservation. So this is just one example. Another example of where this uh, theory could come from is, so that's one example of UV completion. Another one, which is a little bit more uh, formal, and here I apologize, I should have written that at the, at the bottom. <laughs> <Let me. laughs> so this is my IR, which just depends on one field of this form. And then it has an infinite number of other operators that I can't write down. I don't want to write down right now. But another possibility is that this came out from having integrated out. This is similarly to what we've done yesterday and the day before. A massive field chi in a partial UV completion. So we have our low, low energy field phi. We have another massive field uh, squared. So this one is massive. It has a mass uh, m squared chi squared. I'm going to put a parameter here, uh, beta, it's just to parameterize things, but it has a mass uh, m. So I do that. Uh, and my low energy effective field theory would be valid for energy scales much smaller than m. And then if this was the end, integrating this out, we wouldn't give me anything for the field phi. But now I add an interaction between the two, a slightly different scale, that comes in of this form, where that scale, um, I have a hierarchy between lambda So this is a partial UV completion, which is valid all the way up to the scale lambda star. And below the scale M, I can integrate out the massive scalar field. And I'm left with almost this effective field theory. Actually, I'm left, I'm left with something which looks like that. The real operator, it looks like there, is really minus beta squared over 2 lambda to the 4 d phi squared and then m squared box minus m squared d phi squared. That, that is a tree level in this case. So rather than having this, integrating out the field chi in this partial UV completion, you would end up with this type of thing. This is an exercise you can do as well. And then you can see that if you do uh, operator expansion, you expand all of this in powers of box over m squared, the leading order term will be from here, plus beta squared, the scale m will cancel out, d phi to the 4. So this c in this case is equal to beta squared, uh, up to a factor of 2. Maybe there's a, a factor of 2. So you see that in either, this other example, the same pattern ha seems to occur. If I wanted my partial UV completion to be um, consistent, to be preserve unitarity, I better have that this mass term, that whole mass term is positive. So mass, mass term square is positive. So beta has to be positive, which propagate, has to be real, sorry. In this case, I want beta to be real for unitarity. And this propagate into the coefficient C needing to be positive. Okay, these are just two examples. Of course, I'm not going to go through <laughs> but <laughs> completion in the, in the universe and show you that every single case you have this coefficient C being positive. This is just examples on how it looks like there's a pattern. If I want to consider this low energy effective field theory, it's only consistent, it will only be able to have a consistent high energy completion if I have some constraints on some of those coefficients, some sign definite constraints. Now, for those of you who have explored a little bit those type of effective field theories, you can see, you may know, that the sign of that coefficient in this case is also related to the speed of the scalar field, the speed of the fluctuation of the scalar field on a background for the field itself. So you may have seen that. If you're not, you can look at um, a configuration for now this effective field theory. I'm going to say I have, happen to have a profile which spontaneously breaks Lorentz invariance. This EFT preserves Lorentz invariance, but I have a bulb of matter that creates a spontaneous breaking of Lorentz invariance. And so my scalar field acquires, let me just imagine it has a time-dependent profile for the background. 
we'll do it like this. Let me just see the scales I want to put in. There's probably some lambda in there somehow. Lambda squared. And if you look at this um, background, you say phi now, it is phi bar plus some fluctuations delta phi, which depend on space and time. And then the speed of propagation for the fluctuations on top of this background won't be luminal anymore, and it will be equal to one minus this alpha squared, the coefficient C that we have in our effective field theory here, and then one plus six alpha squared C. And then at this level, that's it if I just consider this operator, but if I were to consider this partial UV completion, I would get an infinite number of other operator contribution to the speed that will go like that, in the correction to the, to the speed. So just to give you a little bit of insight on, if you're not familiar with this, from this term here, you will get some term that look like d mu phi background, d mu delta phi squared, and that's going to change the kinetic structure of my fluctuations about a background that spontaneously breaks Lorentz invariance, and that's how I end up with a result which uh, is not liminal for the speed. That's just because of the fault of the background. So in this case, when you do this type of calculation, you see that requiring the speed to be subliminal tells us that we also need to have the coefficient c being positive. And so there seems to be, in this case, a connection between having consistent high energy completion and preserving our standard notion of causality as we typically learn it. The notion of causality is a little bit deeper than that, but typically, we, at some point <coughs> in our life, we learn that causality is preserved if the group velocity at low energy is uh, subliminal. This statement is not entirely correct, but uh, we can go through that another time. I won't have time to, to go through it. <coughs> so these are motivations in, in trying to um, convince you that even though we we, we're focusing on low energy effective field theories, we still have some information which is lost, uh, which is not lost, um, from the high energy completion, which manifests itself <coughs> through causality considerations. So now what I'm going to do is make this statement a little bit more precise, and I'll start by showing that there's connection between the statement of causality as a whole with some statement of analyticity. This statement of analyticity, I'm first going to look at it at the level of the retarded propagator because this is something I know you've seen and, and it allows us to make contact. And then we can now explore the notion of analyticity more systematically at the level of scattering amplitudes that we can compute within the regime of validity of our low energy effective field theories. This notion of analyticity, why I'm concerned about it, is because it is what will allow you to make contact between a low energy effective field theory with its high energy completion. It's really the, the strap that, <laughs> that brings the boot back to the UV completion is the non-perturbative notion of analyticity. That is the communication that is left over between the UV and the IR. And once I have this connection, then some rules of physics that I like to enjoy, like unitarity, can be brought back from the UV down to the IR to put constraints on the type of effective field theories that we can allow for ourselves in the IR. So that's, that's the logic. The rest is just going to be going through the formalism, but if there's anything you want to remember out of this lecture, is that, yeah, that picture. So that picture over there. So um, I mean, is it clear to everybody why there's a relation between causality and analyticity? No, okay, so let me, let me go slowly through um, the retarded propagator, and that's gonna cost me some time. So that means I'll, I'll take some of the things out later. But if, if not everybody is familiar, let me, let me go through that. So let me just imagine a system, um, a time-dependent system, and I want to kick it. I, I, I'm gonna kick it, so I have a system. And at some point in time, I'm gonna be very mean, and I'm gonna kick, I'm gonna call this 
uh, an external source in the same way as we included uh, external sources when we're considering um, spin one and spin two particles. So at some point in time, I'm going to add a source to the system, whatever I want, I just click it, and I'm going to explore the response of the system. The response as a function of time. For causality to be preserved, in our standard notion of causality, this is very symbolic, very uh, cartoon-like, but <laughs> I would like the response to occur at or after I have kicked in the source, not before, otherwise I violate the causality. So my, my response should come in after, and then I don't know what is going to happen, but I, I don't want my response to occur before uh, the external source is applied. So that means that if I explore the response as a function of time, I can write it as an integration of a, a retarded propagator, t minus t prime, of the external source of t prime. This is typically the way we write it. So the retarded propagator characterizes how a system will respond without needing to know what the source is. It's characteristic to the system. And then for a particular source that we put in, we know what the response will be. And so our very naive notion of causality tells us that this retarded propagator should be zero before you switch on the source. That's what we want out of the retarded propagator. Now, if I write the retarded propagator in Fourier space, I can write it as an omega e to the i omega t. Oops. And if I look at how... Um, to perform this integral in Fourier space, I have the real part of omega here, the imaginary part of omega there. If I want to compute what happens for t is negative, when t is negative, um, I want to, um, I think I did that wrong, I think I want a minus sign here, actually. It doesn't matter too much in reality um, for the point I want to make. Yeah, so if C is negative, I have it like that. I want to, to compute this integral, I want to deform it through the upper half of the complex plane so that the overall result is negative. I'll have uh, an I from the complex plane, a plus I, an I here and an I there, that will be a plus sign. And if C is negative, this integral will decay exponentially if I perform such an integral by deforming it through the upper half of the complex plane. So this integral will be equal, performing a Cauchy integration formula, the sum of the residues for which, of the pole for which the imaginary part is positive for t is negative. And for T is positive is the sum of the poles the, uh, for which the imaginary part is, is negative, if I didn't screw that up. Okay, so the requirement of causality, which tells us that the retarded propagator should be, vanish when T is negative, tells us that there should be no poles in the upper half of the complex plane so that you don't catch up any support for your retarded propagator for T is positive. So the statement of causality manifests at the level of the Fourier transform of the retarded propagator as the statement that G tilde of omega should be analytic in the upper half of the complex plane. So there's a relation between the statement of causality and the statement of analyticity and in the case of scalar field theories, it's actually a two-way uh, discussion we can have. 
In order to have causality, you need to have analyticity. So you can make that statement much more precise, but I don't want to spend too much time on that either. This is just to give you some insight on what the connection between the two are. But now that you know that there's a connection between causality and analyticity, what it tells you is that you can also, from low energy physics, have some, oh, let me just say from high energy physics, from the statement of analyticity that encodes some information from high energy down to being valid up to arbitrary low energies. And that is at the level of the retarded propagator. Now we would like to understand effective field theories and how they interact with one another. And so we want to export this these uh, notions to something related to the interactions of the effective field theories. So we're going to export that to the scattering amplitude. And for this, I'm going to consider, I'm going to commit to a scalar field theory to start with. So I consider I have a field phi of mass m, which can be as small as you want. And what I'm going to look at is how the system behaves when I scatter states of this field phi. And I'm going to look at something quite specific. I'm going to look at a two to two scattering process. So I imagine I have a situation where I have an incoming state, another incoming state, they interact, and then I have a state three and a state four coming out. Um, of that process. So this is a two to two, two scattering um, amplitude. I can describe this process through uh, an amplitude. So you have a scattering amplitude, which you would like to preserve uh, unitarity. I'll discuss more about that in a second. And this you can write down as the interacting part. If you have an incoming state, T, sorry, final state T, I, you can always write this as 2 pi to the 4. I'm going to strip out the delta functions. And you have an amplitude which depends on the ki, where these are the momenta. So I have a k1 here, a k2 here, etc., k3 there, and k4 there. So I'd be interested in the scattering amplitude A itself. And we know that for a 2 to 2 scattering, it's useful to work in Mandelstrom variables. So I can define S is the center of mass energy square. This is in my notation equal to K1 plus K2, sorry, K2 squared. T is equivalent to the momentum transfer, is related to the scattering angle. So if T is zero, I have uh, scattering, which is just like this, but typically I'll have something like that. So that would be related to the scattering angle. T is related to that. That would be K1 plus K3 squared. And then the last Mandelstrom variable is K1 plus K4 squared. Those three Mandelstrom variables are not independent for a scalar field of mass M or for a field of mass M. We have that S plus T plus U by conservation of momentum and energy momentum is equal to four M squared. So U can always be related to the, to the two others. So typically my amplitude now will be a function of S and T. And that's what I'll be interested in. So if I look at how um, this amplitude behaves, similarly to what we did for the retarded propagator, we want to see how it behaves in the complex S-plane. So let me go into the complex S-plane. I have the real part of S here, the imaginary part of S here. Just uh, for comparison, S symbolically, is related to the energy square we had before. <laughs> this is not a precise statement, this is uh, symbolically. So having the upper half of the complex plane for omega corresponds to having the whole complex plane for S. 
So the statement of causality, as we had it before, here will manifest itself through some statement of analyticity of this scattering amplitude in the whole of the complex plane, aside from so, some structure present in the real axis related to the physics occurring there. So one thing that we do know is occurring is that we have a massive state of mass M. So that manifests itself as a pole in a complex plane as M squared. So we'll have some contribution that goes like S minus M squared, right? The interchange of um, some states. So we expect to have a pole in a complex plane at S squared. So this is, if you imagine you have a process like that, and then you have an interchange of the parts, so actually it should be that one. You'll have an interchange um, of a virtual particle corresponding to a pole in the complex plane at M squared. What you do know as well is that if you start scattering with sufficient energy, you're gonna have loops occurring and interacting theories, and those loops start occurring if you scatter with uh, energy which is larger than 4m squared. So it's the sum of the two masses of the particle, s is squared of that, so it's 4m squared. So from 4s squared onward, you need to consider loops of the field itself. I'll, con I'll, uh, I'll designate those loops as, as light loops in the low energy effective field theory. And that will lead typically to an imaginary part of the amplitude from the loops themselves and lead to a branch cut present in the complex structure of the amplitude. So a priori, this is what we have. But we're going to also demand crossing symmetry. Which is motivated in particular by Lorentz invariance which tells you that if you have a process which is one, two, three, four, and imagine I have, let me imagine, I consider this is fake, but let me imagine I have time, I think of time here and space there. This is my amplitude of S and T. I can consider the crossed situation where I have one here, three bar there, two bar here, and one there. So these are the same if now I consider um, this to be time and this to be space. This would be roughly the same. And that corresponds to an amplitude which is the U channel instead of the S channel. And so re re demanding that those processes lead to the same amplitude tells us that those two amplitude in the should be the same. But we said that S can be related to T and uh, U uh, and um, S. This is equal to 4M squared minus S minus T. And so there's a symmetric part to everything I talked about related to the pole that you have at M squared. You also have, and T zero, you also have a pole at three M squared. And this, let me just do this at T zero for simplicity. So you also have another pole by crossing symmetry at three M squared. And that branch cut corresponds to a branch cut in the negative part of the real um, S-axis. So this is the analytic structure of mass scattering amplitude in the complex S-plane. Okay, I'm sorry this is taking a bit of time, but we're, we're almost there. So now, in that, in, in that, in that uh, situation, we, can ha we have a low energy effective field theory, uh, and it is valid up to some scale lambda. I don't quite know what this scale lambda is. It depends on the context. But I can imagine that within the complex plane here, this is lambda squared, there's a region of validity of my low energy effective field theory. So 
wherever I am within this region, I can use my low energy effective field theory, compute the scattering amplitude using the operators that I get from this low energy effective field theory, and hopefully trust the answer within some regime of validity. When I go beyond this regime of validity, physics still exists, <laughs> the world still exists, there is still an answer to the question of what would happen if I scattered those states with an increased energy. However, I can no longer use my low energy effective field theory to compute it. That's okay, I just need to include whatever physics comes in. And in principle, you could compute the amplitude, you could ask the question of what the amplitude is up to arbitrarily high energy. I don't know what the answer is using my low energy effective field theory, but I can ask the question. And the answer to this question should still satisfy the law of physics, and in particular, this amplitude should still be unitary. So the statement of unitary here manifests itself through the requirement that the imaginary part of the amplitude should be positive. It should be positive in the part of the branch cut which is within the region of validity of our low effective field theory. But it should be also unitary and positive all the way up to infinity. So are you familiar with the statement that unitary, unitarity manifests itself as the level of the amplitude through the statement that the imaginary part of the amplitude is positive? I think that as I know. Okay, so what you are probably uh, familiar with is that if I compute our scattering process, the cross section. Sigma should be positive. You're probably familiar with that. The cross section in this uh, 2 to 2 scattering amplitude is related to the imaginary part. Let me just say that because you're probably familiar with that. And now let me just uh, be a bit clearer in a second. So the cross section at T0 is equal to the imaginary part. This is something you can prove of the scattering of a S. S minus four m squared. So this should be positive in the physical region, in that region. If you're not familiar with that statement, you may have seen uh, some pictures like that saying that the imaginary part of a complicated process, which is an elastic process, is equal to the sum you can, you can do a cut along that, and this is sum of the intermediary um, states coming in, and then all sorts of intermediary states here squared, which is positive. You may have seen that. If you haven't seen that, don't worry. I'm going to explain it in another way. It's just, just trying to make contact with things you may have seen in the past. More formally, what we can say is that we want unitarity, which tells us that it's a statement about the scattering amplitude. It has to be S dagger S is equal to the identity. This is the statement of unitarity. And we split S, I wrote S as one plus I, the transfer matrix T over there. So if I write that down there, I get that one minus I T dagger minus T plus T dagger T is equal to one. Just expand S as one plus I T as it's written above. And so that tells me that the imaginary part of T, let me just be a bit more Specific. This tells me that I T minus T dagger is equal to T dagger T. And if I write that down in terms of the amplitude, you will get that two times the imaginary part of the amplitude is equal to the amplitude squared. Really what it tells me more concretely, is that if I consider a scattering amplitude from an initial state to a final state which is the same, I'll get the sum of all possible intermediary states of 
A I K, which is positive. And this is in the physical region where S is larger than 4M squared. So this is the statement of unitarity, which I want. This is what we, we would like to ensure that however my low energy effective field theory gets completed at high energy, however this is going to happen, I don't know, but I like to ensure that unitarity gets preserved. And so the imaginary part of the amplitude on this branch cut has to be positive, not only where I'm allowed to compute it with the tools that I have, but all the way up to infinity, where I can't compute it with the tools that I have, but I still want to impose this. So the imaginary part of the amplitude has to be positive here. And then from the statement of crossing symmetry, it also has to be positive here. Because the two things are the same. Okay, so we're almost there. Now we have almost all the tools. We're going to simply put them all together. I promised you that the statement of causality, which manifests itself through analyticity, will be crucial. And the way it is crucial is in connecting the UV to the IR and in connecting the imaginary part of the amplitude being positive in the UV to what happens in the IR. And this can be stated through a uh, Cauchy integration formula. So from analyticity, I can express, let me just do it at SE0, the value of the amplitude at SE0, at SE is uh, small, through a uh, Cauchy integration formula. So let me say now, this is no longer lambda, this is, I can't, well, let me redraw it. Let me redraw all of that. Okay, that's going to be the last um, complex plane picture I drew for today. Let me redraw it because I want to do something slightly different with it. So can you see it's hidden behind the shade? Better here? So we have, again, in our complex plane, this is the real part of the center of mass energy squared, the imaginary part. We say we have some poles here, and then a branch cut coming here, a branch cut coming there. And other than these features in the real part of the um, S plane, the amplitude should be analytic in the whole rest of the complex plane. So it should have no pole, no branch cut in the upper half of the complex plane, no poles, no branch cut on the lower half of the complex plane. And so that tells me that if uh, I'm a, I am at low energy, let me imagine uh, I am here, I can compute the amplitude at a given S, let me just do it at, C, is, at T0, through a Cauchy integration formula of the amplitude mu zero, mu minus s, d mu, so long as I ensure that the contour I'm using doesn't include any poles. So I can consider a contour like this. And then I remove those. So my contour is this one. And if you want to, you can then remove C prime. So in that region between C and C prime, 
the uh, amplitude should be analytic. And so I can relate the, the value of the amplitude at a, at a given point. I can choose this within the regime of validity of my no energy effective field theory and connect it with the amplitude itself on a contour which can be arbitrarily large. In particular, I'm going to take this contour. You can bring it all the way up to uh, infinity and be sensitive to the collapse between these two parts of the contour on the complex, uh, sorry, on the real axis, which will pick out the discontinuity of the amplitude along this branch cut. And the discontinuity of the amplitude along this branch cut is equal to the imaginary part of the amplitude, which we argued is positive from unitarity. So from unitarity all the way up to infinity. So I can do that with this further statement of locality. And I don't want to go spend too much time on that. I can answer questions on locality uh, later if you want. That tells you that if you have a Fourier transform, you want to be able to, for us here, you want to be able to go back to uh, the real space. And for this, you need to be able to have some level of convergence of the amplitude when you go to infinity. You shouldn't blow up too fast. It's been shown by Martin in the 60s that if you want to ensure that it's uh, bounded by at least an exponential, ultimately you'll have that in the limit when S goes to infinity for a massive scalar field, the amplitude of S and T has to be bounded by S log S, the very least, which for S tells us that if you take the limit of S minus two, of the amplitude, that should be equal to zero. And so this, this part here, when mu goes to infinity, itself may blow up. But if I take two as derivative of those, I'm going to capture two additional powers of mu on the bottom in here. And the integrand, uh, the, the integral, as you send the contour to infinity, will go to zero. So you'll have that the second S derivative of the amplitude is equal to, let me say, it's the amplitude at zero mu minus S, uh, minus uh, S, yeah, square D mu. This is over C plus over C prime. And when I take that contour to infinity, I send it to infinity. All the contribution from the upper half here and the lower half there of the circles themselves will go to zero from locality. And what I'll be left with is just the poles themselves and the imaginary part of the amplitude coming from the discontinuity between this side of the contour and that side of the contour. So when I send the radius of the contour to infinity, what we are left here are the poles at low energy, which you can compute. You know what they are. Plus, there's a factor of 2 pi i. I don't remember exactly how it goes. Uh, and then the d mu from 4m squared to infinity, the imaginary part of the amplitude mu 0 over mu minus s cube d mu and the cross symmetric one. So this is the S uh, branch cut and you have a U branch cut as well. Now those you can compute, you know what they are. It is within the regime of validity of your low energy effective field theory. It's just a pole at uh, m squared and 4m squared and this Communitarity, you know, is positive. And the statement that you're connecting with the UV is that it's positive all the way up to infinity. So all that information is folded in. And so from the statement of causality through analyticity, unitarity through the cross, um, through the optical theorem, um, locality and Lorentz invariance and some other uh, information through crossing symmetry, you left with a statement that at low energy, 
So what I mean by that is within the regime of validity of the law under effective field theory, it better be the case that the second derivative of the amplitude of S, and here I applied it at T0, but you don't need to, minus the poles that you can compute, has to be positive. That's actually the case. And this, uh, for convenience, uh, derived it at T0, but you can actually derive it uh, at T is anything between zero and uh, M squared. Let me bring that back up. That is one bound which we call positivity bound, which allows you to connect some information about consistency of the UV without being too specific on what the UV is with some consistency of the low energy effective field theory. So if that assumption, if that result is violated in a low energy effective field theory, then you know that your low energy effective field theory will never be ultimately embeddable in a consistent high energy completion, which is causal, local, and unitary in Lorentz environment. So then it's up to you to decide which one of these assumptions you want to break. Probably not um, unitarity, probably not causality. Typically, you have more freedom with locality. We can, we can talk about that. So in the last five minutes that I, that I have left, let me just say, uh, go back to the example that we have, just to uh, close the loop. So we had a low energy effective field theory that looked like this. And here it's gonna be trivial to see how the requirement, this positivity bound, the requirement yeah. that the derivative of the amplitude twice with respect to S has to be positive at low energy enforces the coefficient C to be positive for any high energy completion. Thank you. So you can compute this amplitude. In this case, it's quite simple. I'm just gonna do this at three level. From here, you have a vertex that scales like that. So you have your particle one with K1, K2, K3, K4. So the amplitude itself will be equal to some factorial coefficients, C over lambda to the four. And then the vertex itself involves four derivatives. It goes like K1 dot K2 squared for one of them plus, actually it's a, it's a minus is all over here, k1 dot k3 squared plus k1 dot k4 squared, it was roughly like that. But this operator, the phi to the four, as a Feynman rule that will correspond to k1, k2, k3, k4, with various contractions of them, right? Sometimes it's mu, mu, alpha, alpha. Sometimes those two are contracted. Sometimes the other one are contracted. So those are the, all the different ones. Uh, I think this is more or less correct. Forgive me for the prefactor in front. I, I don't have them on top of me. But you can re-express this in terms of your Mandelstam variable. And this will go like F squared plus uh, something that goes like u squared plus t squared. And then in u squared, you can re-express in terms of full m squared minus s minus t squared. So when you take the second derivative of the amplitude, let me just take it at s and t are zero here. This is just gonna give you something. There's a factor there. There's a factor here, which is positive. <laughs> Trust me, <laughs> it's positive, it's a bit crucial. <laughs> so I just, uh, the most important aspect I'll just, <laughs> no, but this is correct otherwise. This goes like C of a lambda four, which has to be positive from the positivity bound at this direction.
And so it wasn't an accident that the two kind of partial realizations of how such a theory could come from, both of them led to that coefficient C being positive and how this seemed to be consistent with the notion of subliminality, which typically we relate to the statement of causality. All of those require this coefficient C to be positive. This is actually now at the level of a theorem, but it has to be the case. It has to be the case for such a theory to enjoy a priori uh, standard high energy completion, standard in the sense of uh, unitarity, causality, locality, and Lorentz invariance. So for this example, it's all fine, but because I say we did a lot of work for something we already knew through other means, so why do we do that? It's precisely because now we want to export all of these notions to the FT of gravity, or you can do that even to the FT of physics beyond the standard model. People are applying those type of rules for all sorts of different type of effective field theories. But because uh, I've been assigned to a lecture called EFT of gravity, let me just apply that in the last minus five minutes that I have in the EFT of gravity. And that's gonna be quick because <laughs> I'm gonna gloss through any of the, any of the details. But just as an example, to give you closure on how um, this may or may not be relevant to uh, anything we talked about. Let's go back to an EFT of gravity. Um, and people apply it just to the pure EFT of gravity without any other coupling to other fields. That's absolutely uh, possible. Yeah? If the theory can be inferred, sorry. Uh, you have, I mean, you, you get this theory by yep. breaking out a massive field. This is my EFT now. I'm not going to tell you where it came from. Yeah, but you had you a, a different theory with a, this field sky, right? I had, a par, I had an example of a partial UV completion or where that low energy EFT could come from. That was an yeah, example. In the, you provide a theory, it's going to be anything. And the, the low energy theory, I mean, in the theory, C is called it's no, no. In that example, which I uh, erased, this C was equal to a beta squared, and the beta was the related to the mass of the chi field. So beta has to be real for unitarity of the partial UV completion. Yeah, yeah. If if I didn't write that, if I, if I put a squared here, I made a mistake. This is the relation, yeah? Okay. So you can apply again to, to the pure uh, EFT of gravity involving higher order dimensional operators. I'm not gonna do that here just because I want something quite simple. I'm gonna do it the EFT of gravity, of um, a model of dark energy that people have been considered. And also the reason I'm doing that here is because I've seen there's a few posters about uh, related to dark energy, so I thought that may be relevant for, for here. Something that people are considering, not necessarily me, uh, but people in the uh, community are considering, is an EFT of, of uh, dark energy, where you have, it's really a scalar tensor low energy EFT. You have gravity. And then you have a scalar field, which you will like it to be your dark energy field. And then you have many type of other operators that come in. One of the operators that are considered is a non-minimal, a, non a conformal coupling between that scalar field and R is the curvature, d phi squared. This is not the best model uh, phenomenologically, but it's the best model for me to provide a bound without too much effort, so that's why I'm gonna focus on this right now. I mean, first of all, you could do that, and then you'll have also some coupling to matter. And you can consider a minimal coupling between gravity and some other external field. So H0 here, you can think of it as being the scale of dark energy. So the H0 is actually the scale of the Hubble parameter today. This seems like a tremendously small scale. Bear in mind that in R, you really have some H, d squared H, other M Planck that comes in, 
when you come in there. So this operator is not, it, it's not like the EFT breaks down at the scale H0, at the Hubble scale. It breaks down at the scale M Planck H0 as well, which is a bit higher. <coughs> it's not 10 orders of magnitude higher or something like that. So you, you, have, you have some region of um, consistency of this low energy effective field theory. Now, if you look at the speed of gravitational waves in here, you'll have some non-trivial mixing between the scalar field in uh, your profile background. So you can see the phi to be as uh, we had before, some profile, phi bar, we said it's an alpha, um, I think it's a lambda 3t, or lambda 3, that's a lambda two. So it's an M Planck squared H zero T, something like that. Consider such a profile, and you'll have some mixing, kinetic mixing between the degrees of freedom of your graviton and your scalar degree of freedom, and the speed of gravitational waves in this case will be given by something like one minus X A one over one plus A one X. Sorry, let me just give you the exact thing. I'll give you one over one minus four phi dot squared over m Planck squared h zero squared a one over one plus phi dot squared. So naively, if you'd think if you want the speed of gravitational wave to be subliminal, that would correspond to A1 being, let me see here, negative. So that this thing here at the bottom is positive, and so that the speed of gravitational wave is um, subliminal. So C gravitational wave squared is smaller than one, tells you this. So from this EFT, you'd think, well, causality and all of those things tells you that the coefficient A1 you can allow for yourself in here has to be negative. But then you go into your positivity bounds. And in this case, I want to do a positivity bound between not just phi, phi scattering, but I can do a phi to a matter field, minimally coupled to gravity, psi coupling. They don't interact directly through one another, but they interact through the intermediary of gravity, h minu, and then you'll have a phi here, and I chi there. Now I'm going to compute the scattering amplitude associated with this process. We'll have some m Planck here, we have some m Planck there. All of this will be m Planck suppressed, but I can still ask the question. And the amplitude in this case, Phi psi goes to phi psi is equal to A1 S squared. This, uh, you can do it. There's a better way to do it in another frame, but I'm doing it in this frame, especially to provoke you a little bit. So you can do this. I don't have time to go through the details, but you could go through the same machinery as we did over there. You have some derivatives coupling in here. You have some derivatives coupling here through minus a half g mu nu deep psi squared. Let me imagine my, my field is a scalar field, no matter field. It can be another field you want. Okay, you'll have this. And so the positivity bound tells you that the coefficient A1 has to be positive. That tells you that the speed of gravitational wave in this case have to be actually a little bit subliminal. That's okay. The speed in our gravitational context is not frame independent. This is just because you put yourself in a frame where you change the structure of your light cone, but causality is still preserved. And you still have, this is actually the right thing to do. In this frame, the scalar field phi is luminal. And that's really what you wanted, is luminal, tells you that the scalar field phi is sub is slower than the gravitational waves, and that's what you want to preserve causality. But if you were just to do this calculation at the level of the speed, you may get a little bit confused. When you do it at the level of the scattering amplitude, it's completely frame independent. It's 
completely observable independent. You get a statement which is true in any frame, and that's what the positivity statement tells you. Now, this can make, you can make a direct analogy with causality. What I said in Word and I haven't proven is that you actually have an infinite number of bounds on this uh, positivity bounds. It's not just a statement that S at zero is positive. You can do it for any T uh, smaller than M squared. And then you can also take any number of T derivatives in it and you'll have some uh, positivity statements and people are becoming more and more um, clever in deriving more positivity bounds, relying on not only S and U crossing symmetry, but S, T, and U crossing symmetry, which allows you to have compact bounds now on those parameters. They're not only compact and they're not only bounded from one side, you get them bounded from both sides, and you can really allow yourself to restrict your low energy effective field theory much, much more. Okay, the last thing I want to say, just to, to finish this story, uh, you, you, you know gravitational waves are, are luminal. So why are we, people are even talking about this type of effective field theory where the gravitational waves will depart from the speed of other species. This is a low energy effective field theory. You always need to include arbitrary number of operators at the scale of your cutoff that will come in and they will always manifest themselves as higher derivative corrections, higher corrections at the level of the speed. And actually, in the scalar field example that we did earlier that I erased, we computed the speed at low energy, but we also had a partial UV completion in which we could compute the speed at all frequencies from low energy to high energy. And at high energy, the scalar field phi has just a standard kinetic term with no d phi to the four interactions and is manifestly luminal. So in any of these low energy effective field theories, if you see a departure from luminality at low energy, this is coming from the fact that you're spontaneously breaking Lorentz invariants at low energy from your background. But when you are at high energy, you should be completely insensitive to this aspect. It's just like when you shine light through a prism, the, the high frequency mode are, are traveling at the same speed as, as if they were in the vacuum because they're not interacting with the medium of the glass through which they're propagating. So at high frequency, things are just behaving as if they were not interacting anymore and the speed recovers perfect luminality. So that's the same thing in here, um, or in uh, the scalar field theory I, I wrote before. You have a low energy effective field theory where you see a speed. And this is true for the phase velocity, just like it's true for the growth velocity, which is maybe not liminal because of the spontaneous breaking of Lorentz invariants from your background. But you have to be the case that a high frequency, you go back to luminality by Lorentz invariants. This has to be. This always has to be the case. And in all the examples where you have, where you can make the connection between the UV and the IR, you see that occurring. Um, so the, the statement of subliminality is true at low energy, but at high energy, you always need to go back to having perfect luminality if you want to preserve Lorentz in mind. Um, okay, I'll stop here. Sorry for running so much out of time. <laughs>